Okay, and I'm gonna do a screen share here. Pop us all out to um, my notes. There we go. All right, you don't want my bonding notes, you want new notes. Okay, good deal. All right, just a few things, guys. I haven't forgotten about your um, next lab experiment that you're supposed to be writing up, which is the calibration of the burette. It's actually, um, I think, at the end in the problem section of chapter one, if you have your textbook, but presuming that some of you don't have textbooks yet, um, I'm going to go ahead and just make a copy of it and post it up to D2L. I actually started working with it today, but I got about five different things going on today. But I promise you in the next day or two, I will have that up for you so you can start getting it into your notebooks. There was one little part that I um, forgot to add into the PDF, so I need to go back and fix that before I post it. But I'll have it up to D2L ASAP. Um, if you don't see it by like tomorrow sometime, somebody email me and remind me. <laughs> I try to stay on top of these things, but I'm not always um, not always successful. All right, guys, any questions from either lab last night or Monday lecture? Is everything kind of fitting together okay so far? Yep. And the one thing, yeah. And the one thing I am gonna remind you guys of is, um, given that it's gonna be a regular lab on um, Tuesday, I'll probably have a quiz ready for you guys. Now we won't have really done anything in the lab so I could ask you something about the calibration of the burette in terms of just reading over the procedure and making sure you understand it. Um, but I could also ask you anything from either today's lecture or Monday's lecture. So that material is fair game for quizzes. So I'll probably have some little quiz for you guys um, on lab on Tuesday since it's just a regular lab. I'll remind you again of that on Monday when I see you again. But for those who like to start preparing in advance, feel free to start doing that. And again, don't forget about your um, homework that's posted. Hopefully we'll get through either today or on Monday, everything you'll need to be able to do that assignment and have it ready for me on Tuesday. I think several of you already started working ahead on that and that's great. All right, so what's today? Today is 310, right? Or sorry, 210, I'm a month ahead of myself. Okay, so what I want to do is pretty much um, pick up where I left off last time. So we were talking about solutions, correct? And I think where we left off was talking about how to make up a solution of a given concentration in a ball flask. Am I right about that? Yeah. Okay, good. That's where I thought I was. All right, so we talked about how to do that. And I think the idea was that we wanted to prepare a solution and just because we're going to use it here in just a minute, we were going to prepare a 0.15 molar solution. of sodium chloride and ACL in water. So I'll just put an AQ for aqueous there. All right, that was the goal. And we figured out what mass of sodium chloride we'd need. And we talked about putting that into um, a 500 mil vol flask and how to make that solution and have it ready to use. Now we want to use it. Okay, so the next thing that you sometimes run into is this idea of dilution. And this happens in the quant lab all the time, and we're going to run into this in multiple labs that we do. And that is, I'm going to provide a stock solution. So either you guys would make the stock solution up in advance, or I would make it for you and have it available to you. In this case, let's say our stock solution is our 0 0.150 molar NaCl solution that we made up in the last class period, okay? So what I might ask you to do is to make a dilution of that solution. So in other words, what I wanna do is make a new solution that has a lower concentration than the original stock solution, all right? So I think this is something you guys probably did or talked about in um, your bonding class, if not in lab, but we're gonna go over it again just to make sure. So here's what I might ask you to do. I might ask you to prep um, one liter of 0 0.050 molar NaCl from your stock solution, okay? 
So as you notice, I'm having you new, make a new volume and I want it to be at a lower concentration. So how would we go about doing that? Well, you guys might remember the dilution equation. Have you ever seen that before? Basically, it says that the initial concentration, the I here represents I. I'm gonna use a big C here for concentration because it could be molarity, parts per million, mass percent, any concentration unit we want. It all works equally well with the dilution equation. V here is the volume. And then I'm going to have C here for final and volume final, okay? So you could also do this in terms of C concentrated, V concentrated equals C dilute, V dilute, or initial final, however you wanna do it. Usually the initial over here is gonna be your concentrated side and the side over here represents the dilute side. Okay. Now, how do we do it? Well, basically, I know what the final volume has to be. That's going to be a liter, right? So we can go ahead and fill this in. I'll just put some numbers here. We know what the final um, volume needs to be. Do I know the final concentration? Yeah, I do know the final concentration. That's going to be there. Okay. Do I know the initial concentration? Yeah, I know the initial concentration. That's going to be the um, concentrating one. That's the 0 0.150 molar NaCl. So really what I want to find out here is what volume of the concentrated solution do I need to add to my new flask, which will be a one liter of all flask to make the new solution once I dilute it to the mark. Okay, so you just solve the equation, right? So basically you know that V initial, your V concentrated is your C final, V final, divided by your um, C initial, right? So now we just throw some um, numbers in there. Your C final is 0 0.050 molar. Your V final is a liter. And your C initial is 0 0.150 molar. Notice what happens. The molars cancel with the molars, even you with liters, and that's what you ought to get. If you work it out, you get 0.33 liters. Okay, so that turns out to be what? Um, 0.33 liters, what is that? Like 330 milliliters, is that correct? I think that's right. So that's what you would go measure out. Now you'd measure out your 333 milliliters of your um, stock or your concentrated, you put that in your new vol flask um, and then you would dilute that to the one liter mark, correct? Then you'd invert to mix just like you normally would and then the solution is ready to use. Okay, so that's the other thing we can do. All right, everybody okay with that? Okay, good. So that takes care of solutions and concentrations for the moment. We'll come back and revisit this at other various points, but that's where we are for the moment. Next thing we want to talk about is some basic math review. I think this corresponds to the um, chapter in your text that is called the math toolkit. All right, now we start out basically with significant figures. How comfortable are you guys with sig figs? Pretty comfortable. Pretty comfortable. Yeah, good. Yeah, I figured as much. So if I wrote down a number, for example, you could tell me how many sig figs. Let's just do just one of them so you can sort of see. Okay, so how many sig figs are in that number? Five. Okay, so which ones are not significant? I guess that's the easier one to ask. Is that leading zero at the very far left significant? No. No, so that's not significant. Is that second zero significant? One right after the decimal point? No. No, No, because it's a placeholder, right? And then what are the other zeros? Well, those are either captive zeros, which are always significant, or they're trailing zeros, which are only significant if there's a decimal point in the number, which there is in this case. Okay, so in this case, you've got five significant digits. Those first two zeros are not significant. So it's always those zero rules you got to remember. Okay, so everybody is clear on that. All right, and then you've got the operational rules, right?
So we can break it down into um, several different types of operations if we want to. We have the adding and subtracting rule. Okay, so a good example of this is we could actually use the periodic table to calculate, say, the formula weight of sodium chloride. Okay, so I'm using um, Harris's periodic table here. So we know that all we have to do is go get the um, molar masses out of the um, periodic table and basically add them together because you got one sodium and one chloride per formula. So we got 22.989. Again, this is coming right out of Harris's 770. And that's grams per mole of sodium. Do the same thing for the chlorine. And that turns out to be 35.453. And that's also in grams per mole. So of course, you would um, just add this up with your calculator. And what you end up getting is 58.442. Seven seven zero. If you add them all up. All right. So now, how far out are we significant? Right. How many decimal places are we going to go in the final answer? Three. Three. That's exactly right. So remember, the way we do this is we find the um, digit that has the fewest um, digits after the decimal place. So we say that's the least precise number. And what I generally like to do is align those and just run a line straight down to see. So what ends up happening is we have no significance past the um, thousands pl thousandths place in the um, chlorine, where you do have significance in the sodium. But since there's no significance past the thousandths place in the chlorine, then we can't say anything beyond that place in the final answer. So what would we do? Well, we'd look to the right and see that seven is five or greater. And we would write our final answer as 58.443, rounding up grams per mole. Okay, everybody remember that rule? So that's your addition subtraction rule. Then the one that's easy is the multiplication and division rule. Okay, so in this case, let's say we have um, a square. And I want to find out the area of the square. The square is going to be 2.088 centimeters as it was measured by 2.088 centimeters, right? That's the definition of a square. The sides have to be equal in length. Now, if I want to get the area of that, well, we know what we have to do. We have to take the length times the width, right? So what's that going to be? That's going to be 2.088 centimeters times itself. And the calculator tells me I get 4.35 carrying all the digits out, 9744. And that's going to be in centimeters squared, right? It's an area unit. All right, so now the question is how many sig figs do we have in the final number? What's our rule on that? It would be two, wouldn't it? Um, I think I can do better than two. And the reason is how many sig figs do I have in the 2.088? Let's start there. How many sig four. figs are four? So I got four sig figs there. Okay, and I got 2.088 again, so I've still got four sig figs there. Okay, so when we multiply or divide, we always look to the number that has the fewest number of sig figs, and that's the number of sig figs our final answer is going to have. Okay, so they both have four sig figs in this case, so my final answer also needs to be good to four sig figs. Everybody remember that rule? So if I wanted to write this to the correct number of sig figs, again, I'm going to have to round up. So I'd call that 4.360 centimeters squared. I think I did that right. Does that make sense to everybody? Yep. All right, good, excellent. Now here's the rule you probably haven't seen. And this is one we're going to use not only in this class, but you're going to use it in dynamics quite a bit as well. All right, and those are going to be your log anti-log rules. All right, so if I have a number, I can take the log of it, right? That is the base 10 logarithm. So that would be the log of x, right? 
Now I can take a base 10 log or I can take a natural log. So on your calculator, your natural log is the LN, but they're both basically doing the same operation. It's taking a logarithm. Now, if you wanna undo a logarithm, in other words, we need an inverse function for that. Okay. What's the key on your calculator that undoes log of X? Oh, that's the 10 to the X key, right? So a log is basically compressing a number, whereas exponentiating a number is making it bigger. So you can see how those two are inverses of one another. Now, the inverse of the natural log is the e to the x key on your calculator. But again, whether we're doing a base 10 log or a natural log or the inverse of either one of those, um, the rule is going to be the same. Okay. Now, as far as log rules go, let's do the log rules first. Now here's what can happen. What we might find is that when we take a log, and let me actually just do this first and then we can sort of build the rule out from it. So let's just take the log base 10 of a number. So we're gonna take the log of 291. Okay, so you can plug that in your calculator and you're gonna get a number out. I did it and my calculator told me that when I take the log of 291, you get 2.46 Okay, so the question now becomes, well, how many sig figs are in that number? And you can see also how the log compresses, right? 291 is a fairly big number compared to 2.463893. Okay, so the log actually takes that big number and compresses it to a smaller number. Okay, so that's kind of the inverse of exponentiating. Now, if you think about this, there's two parts to um, a number that you take the log of, or rather the result of the log. Okay, so I'm going to put a double under the two here, and I'm going to put a single sweep under the rest of this. Okay, now the thing with the double underline is called the characteristic. It's one of those things I probably learned in the seventh or eighth grade and immediately forgot. And then um, the number that follows the decimal point is called the mantissa. All right, now here's what ends up happening. If you take a look at this thing, you could write 291 as 2.91 times 10 to the second power, couldn't you? Okay, so ultimately that 10 to the second is part of the characteristic. That characteristic is gonna represent the power of 10. Oops. whatever X is up there, okay? In this case, it would be two. So here's the deal. Let's look back at the original number. How many sig figs are in the original number before we took the log of it? Three. Three, good. So I got three sig figs here. Now here's the deal. What we're gonna say is that the number of significant digits in the mantissa are equal to the number of significant digits in the original number. Okay, so if 291 has three sig figs, it tells me that I've got significance here, here, and here in the mantissa, okay? Now, notice what happens. If I wanna write this now to the correct number of sig figs based on that, I don't know where I got that little line from, what I would end up getting here would be rounding up 2.464, right? So what happened to my number of sig figs here when I took the log of the number? Is it the same as it was before? It increased by one. Yeah, it increased by one. That's exactly right. Because now the characteristic, which represents the power of 10 of the original number before I take the log, okay, becomes significant because it's out in front of a decimal point. All right. So something that was three sig figs now turns out to be four sig figs. Now, what this means in terms of the log rule is that when you take a log of a number, it's possible, it doesn't always happen, but it's possible that your final answer is gonna have more sig figs than the original answer did, or than the original number did. And you can see that in this um, situation here, okay? Now here's another one just to show this again. 
let's take the log of Avogadro's number. That's a good one because it's a nice um, big number, really big number. And we'll say 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. So let's say that we have what, four sig figs here in the original Avogadro's number. That's what we have. So let's just assume we got four sig figs there. If you take the log of that, calculator is going to tell you that you have 23.779741. Okay, so what does the rule say? Go back and look at your original number. You got four sig figs in there. Now those four sig figs are going to be representative of the mantissa. Okay, so I'm going to underline four digits in the mantissa. Now, what about the 23 out front? Well, that represents that power of 10, right? But that now becomes significant, okay? So we're gonna um, actually pull that out front there, all right? So how many sig figs am I gonna have in that final answer? Six. I think I see six. What we got there, Mike? Password for the computer. That's it. So is this a cap, because I tried it. Um, it's lowercase all the way through. Is there a space? Shouldn't be, it should just all be together. All right, I tried, it didn't work. All right, yeah. I'll come back and... Yep, that should be it. Yeah, that should work on that computer. And not John Richardson, that's the FSC you um, want Yeah, it's, it's the student one. Yeah, that's what we want. Okay, so what do we say? We had six sig figs there. Yep, so we're good. So we increased by, in this case, how many sig figs? Increased by two, four became six, didn't it? Now, does it always work that way? Let's take a natural log this time. Let's take the natural log of 0.519. Okay. That operation, you end up getting minus 0 0.6558514. Okay. Now, go back to the original um, number. How many sig figs are there? Uh, three. Looks like three. Yeah, you got it. All right. Now, here's the deal. We transfer those three significant digits to the mantissa, right? Now, in this case, how many sig figs do I have in the um, in the um, result? Just three. Just three. You got it. Just three. So you don't always get an increase in the number of sig figs when you take a log. In this case, your power of 10 basically hasn't changed, right? So in this situation, you know, there's no characteristic per se out front. So you have a zero there and that zero is not significant. So in this case, you haven't actually gained any sig figs. All right, any questions about that? It's an interesting rule. It's not directly about uh, significant figures, but for units, is, are, is there going to be a special way we're going to deal with that? Or for like our base SI units, what does the logarithm do to it? That's a really, really good question. Um, pH is a really good example. Okay, so pH, let me just show you what that is. pH is equal to the negative log of the hydrogen ion concentration. Okay, and that hydrogen ion concentration is always in terms of molarity, right? Now, here's the deal. Anytime you take a log of a quantity, whether it has a unit on it or not, it becomes a unitless quantity. Okay, so units go away when you take a log. So pH is a unitless quantity. All right, so that's a rule that you're going to see a lot in dynamics. You'll see it in quant as well. But anytime you take a log of a number, even if that number has a unit associated with it, that unit goes away as soon as you take the logarithm. Good question. Does that answer it? Uh, yes. So I'll just put unitless here. Very good question. All right. Now, what about going the other way? What if we're talking about anti-logs? Well, what do you think would happen if I take the inverse log? Do you think I'm gonna, what, what, do you, what does your gut tell you is gonna happen to the sig figs? 
It would go down like probably going to get a decrease. You might get a decrease in the number of significant digits. Okay. So let's do that. So I've got, let's say I want to take 5.96 and raise 10 to that power. Okay. Now, when I do that, here's what the calculator tells me. I get 912011. Another way I could write that is in scientific notation if I wanted to. Okay. I could write it as 9.12011 times 10 to the fifth power, right? Now, here's the deal. Remember the characteristic. Where's the characteristic on the original number? Oh, yeah, it's over here, right? Because I'm taking the anti-log. That represents that power of 5 there. Okay? So if I'm going in the opposite direction and that number out front of the decimal point becomes a power of five, okay, how many sig figs do I have left in the mantissa? There's the mantissa. How many sig figs do I have left there? Two. Two. So basically that means my result is only going to be good to two sig figs. So either which way I write it, it's probably easier to do it in scientific notation. I would call it 9.1 times 10 to the fifth, okay? So that shows a situation where if I'm taking an anti-log, you're kind of going in the other direction. So you're kind of looking for that characteristic there in the original number. And you're saying, okay, that characteristic is not gonna be significant. We only have significance in the mantissa, which is the 0.96 part. And again, we can see a situation where that doesn't always happen. We'll take um, a natural exponential of 0 0.105, okay? When you do this, you end up getting 1.11 times 10 to the zeroth power, which is just 1.11, right? Now, how do I know that's good to three sig figs as I wrote it? Uh, again, I go back to the mantissa, right? And how many sig figs do I have in the mantissa of the original number? I got three. What's out in front for the characteristic? That's zero, but that zero is not significant. Okay, so that tells me I've only got three significant digits in my final answer. So see how the anti-log is really just a reverse of the log rule. Okay, so in an anti-log, you actually could lose sig figs, but you may not always. Everybody good with that? Yeah. So those rules are maybe a little harder to interpret and remember than the addition, subtraction, multiplication um, rules that you do, add, subtract, multiply, divide. But um, they're equally important, and especially I can think of probably in the first maybe three or four weeks of dynamics, you're going to run into an equation where you're going to have to worry about this because you're going to end up having to exponentiate. All right. Next thing, kind of just moving along with the flow of the textbook here. Any questions, by the way? I feel like I'm kind of um, rushing you guys here a little. Everybody okay? Just to expand the idea of earlier, uh, does exponentiation also create unis, unitless numbers? Um, if you're going the opposite way, you could actually end up getting a unit back because it's the um, reverse of, um, yeah, it's actually the reverse of um, taking a logarithm. And I can think of situations like that where you have an exponential of like a delta H up there. And that delta H has to come out in kilojoules, right? So when you actually undo that exponential, the units end up coming back. So it'll just be determined by the context. Yes. And which direction you're going. Yep, you got it. All right. So... Next thing that we want to talk about here, I got to keep track of my time. I think we're okay. Is um, we want to talk about error in measurements. Now this is a huge deal in the quantitative analysis lab because, as I tend, as I told you guys before, it's a technique-based lab. Right, so it's all about developing good lab technique and good habits in the lab. And what you'll find is that good technique and good um, analytical procedure and habit in the lab is going to lead to better results of both accuracy and precision. In other words, we want to get close to the actual answer and we want our groupings to be tight. Okay, 
So the idea here is that we need to be able to identify error and minimize it whenever possible. Okay, so much of what we do in this class involves focusing on minimization of error to the extent that we can minimize it. Now we're gonna find out there's some errors that we really can't control because they essentially represent natural fluctuations in measurements. But many errors we can control. Okay, so if we wanna classify errors in terms of experimental error, we have two different types. We can have what's called systematic error. And this is the kind we like to focus in on in the quant lab. This is sometimes called determinate error. And this is the kind of error that we can actually identify and correct. All right, let me give you an, I, let me give you um, a good example of that. So you guys probably remember using the four place balances last semester, right? And you have to be really careful about how you use those balances. So one of the rules is if I give you an object, let's say a piece of chalk or a piece of glassware or something, and I ask you to get the mass of that thing using the four place balance, right? Let's say you put the item in there and you forget to close the door on the balance. Is that going to introduce an error? Yes. Yeah. And you guys know that, right? Because one of the cardinal rules of using the balance is once you put the object you want to weigh on the balance, you always make sure all the balance doors are closed. Now, why is that important? Well, because air currents otherwise move in there. And when air currents move in, they tend to make an object appear lighter by buoyancy than it really is. Okay, so that's going to give you a systematic error in your mass measurement. It's going to make the object look or appear lighter than it really is because of the um, air swirling or eddying around the item with the open door. Okay, so is the error always going to go in the same direction? Yeah. Is it an error that we can identify? Yeah. Is it an error that we can correct? Yeah, you just close the door of balance, right? So that's a good example of a systematic error. Okay, so something like not closing the balance door or having even um, sim more simply an incorrectly calibrated balance. Okay, that would show the error in the same direction each time and probably by about the same magnitude. And that's something that we can identify and correct. Okay, another one that pops up from time to time is we do a lot of volumetric um, work in the lab using a burette. So have you guys all used a burette before? I'm guessing you probably have, right? And if you use a burette, you have to make volume measurements and you have to be able to read a meniscus, right? And we talked about a meniscus last time. So one thing you can have is something called parallax error. If you're not looking straight on horizontally at the meniscus, if you're looking at it from below or above, that essentially changes the position of the meniscus on the line, okay? So as a result, you're gonna get an error if you're always over the top of the meniscus looking down on it as opposed to looking straight at it, okay? That's what we call parallax error. That's an error that we can identify and an error that we can simply correct by just looking straight on at the um, level of the liquid against the meniscus instead of looking straight, looking down at an angle or up from an angle at the um, meniscus. So that's another good example of that. So there are lots and lots of things like that that we're gonna talk about in the quant lab. So in many situations, I'm gonna call attention to these things so that they're errors you can think about and not make when you're trying to make these kinds of measurements. Okay, so a lot of that kind of error that I'm gonna to try to keep you minimized at is systematic error because I can identify it and control it. Okay, does that make sense to everybody? Then there's the other kind of error. The other kind is called random error. All right, and that's called indeterminate error sometimes. Now, this is gonna be essentially error due to natural random fluctuations in a measurement.
So for example, I could again ask you with four place balance to uh, measure the uh, mass of an object. And I could ask you to do it 10 times in a row. My guess is that every time you do it, you're not always gonna get exactly the same answer to the last decimal place. There may well be some random fluctuation in that last decimal place of the balance that you have no control over, okay? So is that error that we can identify? Yeah, we can identify it, but can we do anything about it? No, we can't. And that's what I mean by random error. It's sometimes also called statistical error, okay? And the reason for this is because we apply the rules and laws of statistics to this kind of error because of its random nature, okay? So when we start doing things like taking means and standard deviations and confidence limits of our data, what we're doing is we're assuming that all of the error present in our data is of a random nature. Now, is it really? Probably not, okay? There's probably gonna be some systematic error associated with your measurements, but we make the assumption with statistics that all of the error is random. And again, it goes back to that whole idea of part of the whole purpose of the course is to try to get you to minimize your systematic error so that anything that's left over is considered to be random, okay? So this kind of gets us back to this idea now of accuracy and precision that we've talked about a little bit before. And again, for certain labs that you're gonna be doing, you're gonna be graded based on your accuracy and precision. Okay, so how do I find define accuracy? Did you get in okay, Mike? Yeah, might get a chance. Yeah, I've got, I've got about 10 more minutes. Yeah, we'll get done, because I'm, I'm gonna run down, I'm gonna grab something out of my front. Okay, yeah, I can get you in. I got the GC fired up, so I wanna just make some injections on the GC. All right, sounds good. Yeah, I can get you in. All right, guys, so accuracy. Accuracy is essentially how close a measured value is to the true or correct value. We have an instrument install happening today, so my um, technician is in here trying to get everything installed and he needs my help from time to time. Now the actual value, the question then becomes, well, you know, where does the actual value coming from? I mean, how can well, I, can I trust it? So going back to, for example, um, analytical results that you guys would give me in a situation like this, chances are good that I would be using a standard of some sort, okay? And your unknown that you would have to analyze would be based on that standard. And that standard will be of a known concentration or a known value that has been independently measured using very, very careful analytical technique. So it always has to go back to a well-referenced standard. Okay, but once we have that value and we know what it is, your goal is to try to reproduce that value using some sort of an analytical measurement, okay? So how close your measurement is to that actual value is a measurement of your accuracy. And obviously the closer those two agree, the better. In other words, you get a higher score, okay? So that's what that's about, precision. All right, when it comes to precision, what we're talking about is essentially how close together a set of replicate measurements are to one another. In other words, that's our grouping. Yeah, any of you guys do any target shooting or you throw darts or things like that? Okay, so you realize you might have a target and you're aiming to hit that target. So I can just sort of draw an example of a target here. 
and there's the bullseye, right? So the idea is you want to hit the bullseye and you got three chances to do it. So let's say we're firing a rifle from 100 yards or something like that, okay? So we might have a situation here where one shot turns out to be there, one shot turns out to be there, one shot turns out to be there, okay? What does that say about our precision and accuracy? What do you guys think? You have good precision, but you don't have very good accuracy. Yeah, in this case, you've got good precision because you have a nice tight group, but you have poor accuracy. Now, here's a question. Is this going to be an example of determinate error or indeterminate error? It could be both. <laughs> well, yeah, you can always fall back on both because, again, there's always going to be indeterminate error. There's always going to be random fluctuation no matter what, okay? And that would probably be um, shown by um, how close together or far apart those groupings are. That grouping is pretty tight. So that tells me that um, my random error there is probably pretty small. In other words, I'm very reproducible about what I'm doing here. Okay. But what about the um, distance of the grouping away from the bullseye? Would you call that determinate or indeterminate? Determinate. Uh yeah, determinate. Yeah, I'd say determinate because that's something you can identify and fix, right? You know, when you're shooting, you have these things called windage and elevation, right? So it looks like um, you're shooting a little bit to the left, and you're definitely high, so you can adjust your sights now to compensate for that. Say if you're using a scope or something like that, you can, you know, notch in adjustments in windage and elevation on your scope now to bring your um, grouping into the bullseye. Okay, so that's determinate. That's something I can identify and fix. Okay, so that's that situation. You know, and just to give you another example or two. Here's the bullseye. What if you had that situation, that situation, and that situation? What would you say about the accuracy? Poor. Yeah, poor accuracy. What would you say about the precision? It's poor. Poor, yeah, I'd say the um, shooter's probably drunk. <laughs> had a little too much kombucha so you know those are the situations what's the situation you really like to see well the situation you really like to see is something that would look like that okay so you have that tight grouping of three right around the bullseye because in that situation we can say that we're both accurate and precise okay so that's really what we're after you know we've minimized the determinant error that we've got and now any little variation you've got there is probably due to random or indeterminate error. Does that make sense to everybody? So ultimately, that's what you want in the quant lab. That's what you're after. That's what you're trying to get. All right. So the next thing that we kind of have to think about when we start talking about precision is that there's really two definitions of precision. First definition that we've applied here talks about how close together that set of replicate measurements are to one another. But the other sort of definition of precision that we can talk about and this usually regards regarding a measuring device. is sort of the goodness or fineness of the measurement we can make using that device. All right, so sometimes this is also referred to as the tolerance of the measuring device. So we can sort of use precision of the measuring device and tolerance of the measuring device as essentially the same definition. And basically what it's telling us is how many decimal places can we go out to with a certain degree of certainty in that measurement? Okay, so for example, we talk about the analytical balance. 
And actually your textbook has some really nice tables that show this. The analytical balance is gonna be good to plus or minus 0 0.123 last place grams, okay? So when I have that one there in the last place, that tells me that the precision or tolerance of the measuring device, in this case, the four place balance, is to the nearest 10,000th of a gram or 10th of a milligram, okay? Now we have three place balances as well, right? So if we use a three place balance, we lose a decimal place. Okay, so as a result, we can't get as many sig figs out of it. Okay, now, if I take a look, for example, at a 50 milliliter um, burette, this is what you guys are gonna do next week. You're actually gonna look at one of these and calibrate it. There, we're talking about a tolerance of plus or minus 0.05 five milliliters. So in other words, it tells me that I'm good to plus or minus five in the hundredths place. Now, as it turns out, by calibrating the burette, I can do better than that. I might actually, for any given volume measurement, I might be able to make a correction to the burette such that I could get that down to 0.01 or 0.02 milliliters, okay, for a 50 mil burette. So, the tolerance is ultimately going to define for us the number of sig figs available in a measurement using that device. Like I said, in the case of the analytical um, balance, you know, I can get, if I'm weighing something less than a gram, I can get four sig figs out of that. Okay. Now, of course, anything to the left of the decimal point becomes significant as well. So if I'm weighing something that's 25 grams and change, I should be able to get six sig figs out of that. Okay, but if I use a three place balance, I'm gonna lose a sig fig because I'm only good to the thousandths place instead of the 10 thousandths place, all right? So what I'm talking about ultimately here is how many um, sig figs and decimal places I can get out of a particular measuring device. And that tells me something about the goodness of the measurement or the fineness of the measurement that I'm making. Does that make sense? So yeah. in quant, <laughs> good, good. So in quant, I'm generally, when I'm trying to make a quantitative measurement, I want to use the um, most um, precise device that I have, okay, with convenience that I can use. And the interesting thing about quant is sometimes it matters, sometimes it doesn't, okay? There are going to be times where you just need an approximate, say, volume of a liquid. In that case, does it make sense to use a burette and go out to two decimal places if I only need around 100 mils? No, you can measure that with a beaker. Okay, if it says around or about, that's fine. But if it says to measure out precisely 50 milliliters of a liquid, well, you might want to use a 50 mil burette because you're going to get more sig figs out of the measurement that way. Okay, so it really kind of depends on what you're going to be doing with the number. All right, questions, guys. Everybody okay with me at this point? All right, I'm pushing about 20 after there. I think that's when we're supposed to end, isn't it? Yes, I think it is. All right, so for Monday, we're going to talk a little bit about calculations involving uncertainty and propagation of uncertainty. And then I want to move into statistics. And that should pretty much get you where you need to be to finish out all of the problems that I've assigned for you. And if it turns out we have to go beyond that, I'll just knock the homework um, assignment back to the next week. But we should get there. But I'll let you guys know. And I know you most of you are working ahead on it anyway. All right, any final questions, guys? Okay, and I'll try to get that um, procedure up for you guys in the next day or two so you can um, start working that into your notebooks. And make sure you get a notebook um, sooner than later. You're going to need it next week by um, Tuesday. All right, that said, guys, um, I will see you guys on Monday, I guess. So have a good weekend. You too. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you guys. Then.